This is a mechanism of disease map for type 1 hypersensitivity or allergic reactions. I'll be talking about the etiology of allergic reactions as well as the pathophysiology and the manifestations and I'll throw in a couple notes on the pharmacology used to treat allergic reactions. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these bubbles is color-coded according to the, to the legend up here and I'll be talking through each of these bubbles one by one. So let's start with the etiology. What actually causes somebody to be primed for a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction and how is it triggered? So it usually begins with a prior sensitization. So the person has contact with an antigen before they have their actual reaction. And this prior sensitization forms an IgE against the antigen itself. So IgE is the antibody type that's at play here. This IgE coats the surface of mast cells and basophils. So these mast cells and basophils are now primed to react to the antigen when the body comes into contact with the antigen again. Then, when the person actually has the allergic reaction, they are having a subsequent encounter with the antigen. At that point, it triggers an IgE-mediated reaction by the preformed IgE antibodies. This is why that prior sensitization was important, because these are preformed IgE antibodies that we listed right here. In this reaction, the free antigen binds two adjacent IgE antibodies, and this process is known as cross-linking. So the reaction has been set in motion now, and you have an immediate um, degranulation of mast cells and basophils, and this is a pretty rapid process. When these mast cells and basophils dump their contents, you have immediate release of mediators. The most prominent is histamine, but there are many others, including prostaglandin, platelet activating factors, leukotrienes, heparin, tryptase, and other cytokines and pro-inflammatory mediators kind of follow downstream. So you have like a full um, immune allergic response. These have broad reaching effects throughout the body. Some of them are localized. For instance, in the subcutaneous tissue, you might have angioedema. This is a swelling of the skin. It's particularly concerning when somebody has angioedema, like puffing and swelling around their throat that might restrict their airways. You could have cytokines in the superficial dermis. This can result in hives, and when the hives get big, we call them wheels. These are well circumscribed raised pyritic and erythematous plaques with a round oval or serpiginous shape. So we've all seen somebody that has an allergic reaction that has these like red raised dots all around them. Those are called hives when they're small and when they get really big they become wheels. So that's in the superficial dermis. If you have histamine release in the eye you can have an allergic conjunctivitis. That's like a red eye um, picture. In the systemic circulation, when you have this release of histamine and prostaglandins, they'll cause smooth muscle contraction throughout the body. So in the abdomen, this can result in abdominal cramping, which can manifest as abdominal pain. In the airways, this results in bronchospasm, which can result in the symptoms of coughing and wheezing. This is sometimes called allergic asthma. In the peripheral uh, vasculature, the patient might have vasodilation. Histamine is a powerful vasodilator, and prostaglandin is too. When you have vasodilation in the peripheral vasculature, you'll have increased vascular permeability. When the vascular permeability increases, you'll have extravasion of capillary blood. This means that the blood cells are leaving the capillaries and into the surrounding tissues. This results in erythema, redness of the skin that can form a rash. You're literally having your blood kind of oozing out into your skin, extravasion of capillary blood. Not only blood is going to be extravasing, but you'll also have fluid shift into the interstitial space. This results in edema, and you can have lower extremity edema in the legs. You can also have pulmonary edema, which can lead to even more coughing and uh, dyspnea, shortness of breath, from fluid in the lungs. All of this fluid leaving the vasculature, this capillary blood and this extra fluid leaving the capillaries, results in hypovolemia. So the patient might kind of react as if they're dehydrated. So when you're dehydrated, when you have low volume in your vascular space, you could become tachycardic. You could have low blood pressure. Hypotension, that's low blood pressure, as I just mentioned. And having all of these blood contents spill into your tissue can cause itchiness. So the patient might also have pruritus. Uh, so a lot of things are downstream of this increased vascular permeability caused by this immediate release of mediators. Now, a few notes on the medicines that you would use to treat this. First line is, of course, epinephrine. Epinephrine directly um, opposes some of the effects of histamine. So instead of smooth muscle contraction, epinephrine is a, is a, is a smooth muscle 
dilator. So you'll actually relieve this bronchospasm. You'll have bronchodilation, and that'll relieve the wheezing and the coughing and open up the airways for the patient. Um, epinephrine also has the opposite effect in the periphery. So instead of peripheral vasodilation, you'll have peripheral vasoconstriction. So you'll decrease vascular permeability and immediately increase the patient's uh, blood pressure. So you'll stop the extravasion of blood, extravasion of fluid, increase blood, uh, blood pressure, and squeeze down on all the patient's blood vessels in the periphery. In addition, epinephrine also slows the degranulation of mast cells. So you'll stop this release of mediators. You'll stop the release of histamine. Another set of drugs that you could use, it's definitely not first line, but it might, used in, might be used in conjunction with epinephrine, are antihistamines. This includes uh, first generation antihistamines like diphenhydramine or Benadryl is the brand name for this, as well as cetirizine. This is a second generation antihistamine. It's like loratadine, cetirizine are some of the uh, second generations that you could use for that. These directly affect the histamine receptor, the H1 receptor, I believe, for cetirizine. So you'll block the downstream effects of histamine. It doesn't work as well as epinephrine, so epinephrine is still first line. Now everything I've described so far is considered a rapid reaction. It all happens very quickly and it happens within minutes of exposure to this antigen. So this is all very, very quick. In addition, the body might also mount a late phase reaction. This typically starts hours later, hours after the subsequent encounter with the antigen. And it sometimes lasts for 48 to 72 hours. So in addition to this immediate release of mediators, you'll also trigger eosinophil and neutrophil chemotaxis. So this later phase is largely eosinophilic, whereas the rapid phase is largely IgE mediated and histamine mediated. In any case, when you have the eosinophil and the neutrophil chemotaxis, those blood cells will kind of spread throughout the body and cause inflammation and tissue damage. So they'll have downstream inflammatory effects. And you can have these symptoms. You can have erythema, redness again. You can have rhinorrhea, runny nose, and sneezing, as well as coughing and wheezing. And those can last for two or three days after the major inflammatory reaction. Lastly, a few notes on what might predispose someone to having a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. You're predisposed to it if you have a history of asthma, atopic dermatitis, allergic rhinitis, allergic conjunctivitis, and food allergies. And this makes sense. These are all disorders of IgE and um, histamine-mediated disorders. So that can predispose you to having this major allergic reaction, this type 1 hypersensitivity. Lastly, a quick note on cross-reacting antigens between things you might have in the environment um, and things that you might have in your foods. Pollen cross-reacts with many foods like apples, hazelnuts, carrots, kiwi, apricot, and peaches. Mites, like dust mites, can cross-react with crustaceans, which um, we might eat when we have seafood. Latex, like in gloves or condoms, can cross-react with some exotic fruits, like bananas, avocado, kiwi. Bird dander cross-reacts with egg yolk, and cat dander cross-reacts with pork. So those might be some of the connections you see um, in either your first and or subsequent encounters with an antigen. This has been a short flowchart for type 1 hypersensitivity. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.